While we're on this uh, game show theme, this board game theme, uh, you remember the game Shoots and Ladders? You guys played Shoots and Ladders before? I remember playing it as a kid, and then I also remember playing it with my kids. That game's been around a long time. And I think that game has a lot of great lessons uh, for kids to learn. Uh, but you know how it works. All you got to get across the board, working your way up from number one all the way up to number 100. The problem is you've got uh, these chutes and ladders in the way. You know, I don't know why they didn't call it slides. I think in England they did. Um, but nevertheless. Uh, and, and this is why I think it's a good lesson in life. Because you get big ladders, little ladders. Sometimes as you're going along, you get a little lift up. But on occasion, sometimes you slide back. And sometimes if you land on number 87, it's a really big slide back. But you never know. You might get to number 28 and climb the big ladder up again. I got to tell you, I didn't even have to look those numbers up. How, that's how pathetic I am. I remember the numbers on the game Shoots and Ladders. So, but, that, but that's it. The idea, though, is to keep climbing and keep climbing and keep climbing. But sometimes you're not going to be able to climb on any particular given day. So in, in the life that God has laid out for us, you know, it's very easy to, to fall into the ways of the world. It's really what Jesus was, was aiming at in Matthew chapter 20. It, it's that climbing the ladder thing. It's, it's climbing the ladder of success or of popularity or of wealth, whatever it's going to be. But when Jesus steps into our lives and when Jesus takes over our hearts, he turns things inside out and upside down. Success, Jesus style, is climbing down the ladder. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, Jesus said. As these two guys and their mother were clamoring for the 50-yard line seats in, in heaven itself. And oh, gee, I wonder if the other 10 might be a little bothered by that. But it, it, was, it was a very transparent grasp for, for something that really didn't belong to them, to, to try and climb and climb and climb. But Jesus then, he reverses the whole thing. If you want to be great, you must be your servant. And the word that, that is used there when, when Matthew writes his gospel in chapter 20 in the Greek, it's the word doulos, which can be translated servant or even slave. You must become the slave. Now, we don't like that in modern English. Most of our English translations will stick with the word servant because we can kind of handle that word. When we hear slave, we, we think, you know, 1800s America, that kind of thing. But that's not how God is viewing this. This is voluntary. This is willingly making yourself servant, slave, subject to the needs of somebody else. To their benefit, to their blessing, to their glory, rather than glorifying ourselves. Rather than trying to constantly elevate and accumulate for ourselves. So that means with, with, in any kind of relationship we're in, any kind of group dynamic, in every discussion, in every decision, we need to start asking ourselves, who wins? Who wins by this? Am I, still, am I still in it for me? Am I still trying to grab for myself? Or is this truly going to be the time where I become the servant Jesus has asked me to be? Rick Warren wrote the book, Purpose Driven Life. You open that book and chapter one, the very first line says, it's not about you. And you know, at the time, I was rather professionally jealous of Rick Warren because he sold a lot of books and uh, he and his church made a lot of money off that. And I'd been using that line for a long time and I don't know how he stole it from me. <laughs> but it's not about you. Your life the plan. At some point, Jesus inspires us. Jesus inspires me to get over myself and all the self things that come with it. But you know, we're fighting a lot of human nature there. That, that sinful nature that lives inside of each one of us is hardwired to be all about the self. From littlest age on, uh, when it's time for, for us to line up to go to recess or gym class, it's the clamor to see who goes first, who goes first, who goes first. 
And Jesus is telling us now, if you want to be first, you got to be last. If you want to be great, you've got to be the servant. You've got to be the slave. Now, as we are going through life, on occasion, yes, we're, Jesus is going to give us those little ladders that bump us up. He's going to bless us. He's going to give us things. He's going to give us stuff. Money by itself is not inherently evil. Popularity is not inherently evil. Success is not inherently evil. Money is just a thing. You know, you've heard the phrase, money is the root of all evil. That's not a biblical phrase. It's close, but it's not what the Bible says. What the Bible actually says about money, money is a root, among others, of all kinds of evil. But you see, it's, it's not the money, it's not what's printed on the paper, and it's not what shows up on my bank statement. It's what's going on in here, in my heart, in my attitude towards that money or towards that quest for popularity, because of course I want everybody to like me. And however I want to be able to choose to define success, it's when you get that constant lust for those things. That's where your heart and your life are going astray. That's where you're getting off the path that God has called you to follow. So at that point, if I've made it all about me, and if it's all about climbing that ladder, and if it's all about, all about stepping up, then I've got to figure out maybe who am I stepping on to get there? And who am I standing on to proclaim my success? And who am I stomping on to keep them from taking it from me? Isn't it something that a bully never knows they're a bully. Jesus reverses the flow. He, he changes the whole direction. That's why I say he turns us inside out and he turns us upside down. Because after this mother's request for, the, for these prime seats, Jesus warns them, you know what, you're... Your goal is not to blend in with the worldly people around you. The, the Gentiles, they lord it over people. Not so with you. Love that phrase. Not so with you. The rest of the world, the rest of the culture, everyone else may be doing this sort of thing. Not so with you. If you want to become great, Try becoming a servant. Try becoming a slave. Willingly offering yourself, offering your place, offering your position, offering your popularity, offering your gifts, offering everything you've got, offering everything about you for the sake of anyone and everyone but you. Be the servant. Because then he goes on to tell him, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, you become great by becoming a servant like Jesus. Because you look at what he did, what he went through, and then what he accomplished. This is how we are to be. If we're going to be a follower of Jesus, we want to strive to become more and more like Jesus so that when people see us, they will actually see Jesus. They will hear Jesus. They will experience Jesus because he's living in us and reaching out to them. Becoming like Jesus in servanthood, that means emptying yourself. That's what we just read together in Philippians chapter 2. It says he, he made himself nothing, literally he emptied himself of all the self things and then he took to that little thing up there on the screen called the cross not because it was going to do anything for him not because dying on that cross was some big sort of career move but Jesus did all of this for everyone else even the people that hated him even the people that killed him because at any given time Jesus could have called down the armies of angels thousands upon thousands and he could have kicked the Romans butts and he could have blasted the Pharisees right into hell but he did not do that he stayed there he stayed on the cross for you and for me that my friends is success 
Because if he does not do that, if he saves himself, and they were tempting him, they were taunting him. Save yourself. If you're the Christ, come down from that cross. But he refused to. Because if if he does, if Jesus lives, we die. If he saves himself, he loses us. He loses you and he loses me. And Jesus could not do that. He would not do that. Because he was the servant. Because he loves us that much to empty himself. And to go the distance to the cross. So now this Jesus, now he lives again in us and and he's working on us and he is turning us inside out and he's reshaping our hearts and our minds and our attitudes and our lives to take us from self-ish to self-less. Teaching us to empty ourselves. To to stop being consumed by the acquisitions and rather take that form of a servant. And we're going to go in in bits and spurts, aren't we? We're we're going to find little ladders and then we're going to experience little slides and big slides. But we, we stay the course because God is still working on us. We are all, every single one of us, still a work in progress. The Holy Spirit is working on the inner you. In Psalm verse 16, the Word of God says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. When you experience God, when you experience Jesus Christ, that's when you discover the, the fullest amount of joy a human being can ever know in this lifetime. But it comes when you spend time with God. When you get to know Him, when you get to hear Him. We need to spend time with Him so He can empty the trash and refill us with his saving grace. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, And we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So we got to check our focus. What are we focused on? We need to be focused on the God things, not the world things, not the money things, not the power things, but the God things. And he will empty us and refill us with his saving grace. In 1 John chapter 1, we use this passage over and over again in worship quite a bit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful, and God is just, and God will forgive us our sins, and God will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to confess our sins to God. I know in this, in this current culture and society, a lot of churches don't even want to talk about this, you know, because sin is so depressing. Well, it should be, because it is. It depresses and it kills. We have to confess our sins to God so that we know why we need a Savior. Why we need Jesus in the first place. That we need him to empty us of ourselves and refill us with saving grace. And in 1 Timothy 6, you want to talk about about wealth and about climbing and success and about riches that really matter. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves is a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. This is putting your faith into action. It's not just sitting here and listening about it. It's not just being at home and thinking about it. But it is living the faith that Jesus has put inside you when he filled you with that that saving grace. Because there's people in your life, there's people around you, they might even be in this room, or maybe they're back at home, or they're at work, or they're next door. People who need to be emptied. This country, this world is falling apart in this constant quest for what I want and what I think and I'm right and you're wrong and you're stupid if you don't think like me. Well, I need to empty myself of those things, of those thoughts, of those attitudes. Your attitude, your mindset should be the same as that of Christ who emptied himself, became the servant, 
all the way to the cross. So here's success in the kingdom of God, in the eyes of Jesus Christ. A friend of mine, pastor friend of mine, we were in a leadership program together, and one of the early things they had us do in their small groups is to figure out why God put us here, what our purpose was, what our, our mission in life was. And he came up with this, and I absolutely love it. He said, my mission is to get to heaven and take as many people with me as I can. I love that. I was mad because I didn't think of it first. But there you go. Who's coming with you because of you? Who's coming with you to heaven because God put you in their lives? Who's coming with you to Jesus because what you think and what you say and how you live matters to somebody else? Who's coming with you to church? Who's coming with you to servanthood because you dared to empty yourself and climb back down the ladder. Will you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, forgive us when we get caught up in our own stuff in our own lives, in our own successes, in our own failures, and we obsess on the things of this life. And Lord, help us, empower us, empty us of those things which keep us from being the child of God you've called us to be. And instead, Lord Jesus, fill us with your grace, with the love you poured out from the cross the grace that will feed us this morning at your table, the grace that will carry us through every day of life. Lord Jesus, fill us up again with your love, with your life. Amen. God so loves you that he gave you his one and only son, Jesus Christ, because you believe in him. You will not perish for your sins. You will have everlasting life. You are forgiven. You are saved. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.